and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witt University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, when we talk about the China-Africa relationship, immigration is one of the issues that comes up a lot. And usually it's in the form of Chinese migrating to Africa. Now, the latest numbers that we have, which are not based on anything scientific because they don't actually exist, is these estimates that range between 1 million and 2 million. Uh, in fact, uh, Kobus, you and I saw some research uh, a couple months ago that actually put the number much lower in places like Zambia. So maybe those estimates are way inflated. But the numbers are very, very high no matter what. What we don't talk about quite as much, though, is the migration patterns in reverse, that is, of Africans migrating to China. For the most part, when we talk about African migration, it's usually to Europe or to the United States. Now, this is something that's been in the news a lot lately because of the massive flows of migration into Western Europe and, of course, Donald Trump's uh, travel ban that did affect some African countries as well. So talking about this immigration issue in China becomes very, very complicated because two very important issues sit side by side with one another. On the one hand, there's this dream that going to China will make you rich. It's the land of opportunity. It's the land of promise. People in Africa see all of the products in the market. They see the trade that's booming and they think, I want to get a piece of that. But then at the same time, there is this really difficult experience that awaits so many Africans when they're over there. And Kobus, you and I interviewed, oh, I'd say last year at this time, the tragic case of so many Ghanaians who are coming back with stories of despair. And it's interesting to see how these two worlds sit so close to one another. It's also the story of two different kinds of states and the individuals that try to get in and out of them. Um, in the first place, China, with its massive amount of development, its incredible number of opportunities, and also um, its increasing paranoia about outsiders and, and increasing immigration crackdowns. And then, on the other hand, the African states that somehow can't get their development off the ground and where corruption and underdevelopment makes it impossible to, to pursue your dreams. It's fair to say that China is not an immigrant country. And because it's not an immigrant country, this is a country that has 95, 96% of a single ethnicity, Han Chinese. Uh, it, it, it's notoriously difficult for immigrants to live there because of work visas. Very, very little is actually understood about the immigrant experience as a whole, much less the the African immigrant experience. Now, what's been great is that for the past three or four years, every year, we in the China-Africa space have been blessed with a new documentary that comes out to show uh, a little bit of what's going on there. And they're the latest film that's coming out that's making its way around the film festival circuit in the United States is the Guangzhou Dream Factory. Uh, and it's a fascinating insight to both the, what we, I talked about earlier, the amazing potential and the very, very difficult life that awaits African immigrants. Uh, filmmaker Christian Badgley and producer Erica Marcus are the two uh, people behind this amazing film, Guangzhou Dream Factory. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us very early in the morning from California. Morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. And Christian, let me start with you as the filmmaker. And if I understand correctly, this was your vision to make this this film. And, uh, you know, it's a very complicated story. And I'm just curious about what motivated you to to kind of focus on the African migrant experience in China, which does seem a little bit esoteric for a lot of people, particularly in the United States. Well, actually, the film at the very beginning was a an idea uh, that both Erica and I had. We were working together at a television station, and I have a background working for many years on projects in Africa, and Erica has worked for many years uh, on projects in China. So we began discussing the possibility of making a film together, and initially, we were considering uh, doing something in China and in Africa, uh, maybe one or the other, maybe both. After our initial research, um, we decided that the story in Guangzhou was one we wanted to tell. When we began the film, there really hadn't been uh, much done about Africans in China. And uh, that's changed, of course. But we just found this the community there, what was going on, fascinating, and we thought it would be an interesting story to bring to Americans who understand 
so little about globalization and the movement of people and what's happening outside of the United States. Erica, um, as, a, as the producer of the film, um, can you talk us through the process of getting it getting it off the ground? Um, and particularly also, it, it seems like, you know, while you were making it, the fortunes of the of the African community in Guangzhou was also changing. So the film is fascinating to watch in that sense, where you can see people who are very successful, and then a little bit later, they you know, it shows that they that they are having facing a whole bunch of new problems. Like, what was the timeline of getting the film make made, and how was the storytelling influenced by that? Well, we started doing the research in uh, 2010. Um, and we received a research grant, actually. And then we went um, both um, to Ghana um, and, um, and, um, um, and then Guangzhou as well. Um, and when we went there, um, when we first went to um, Ghana the first time, um, it was, um, I think that was the year that it was the, an the 50th anniversary of, uh, interestingly enough, of Ghana-China um, relations, um, uh, the establishment of Ghana-China relations. And we actually went to um, an anniversary celebration, and we met several people um, there. Um, and, you know, the, the gentleman at the end of the film, um, we, we met there as well. Um, and... Um, he brings the film full. He ends up. He ended up building, bringing the film full circle home. Um, but when we then we went to Guangzhou and we were just wowed by the dynamism of people there. Um, and when we actually spoke to the Chinese in um, Ghana, they said, "We'll speak to you, um, but if you bring out a camera, we won't speak to you." <laughs> so we really also felt that th that alone was another reason to to make the film in Guangzhou. Yeah, it's not, um, not unusual, of course, in, with the Chinese community. Yeah. In Guangzhou, when we first went, um, you know, there was, it was the, the markets were much busier um, um, than they were in subsequent, subsequent years. And each year things changed for the different characters in our film. Christiane, I'd like to take you to the beginning of the film when you open it up and, and you tell about a story of how you, when you lived in Ghana, and you, you bought a knife, and you brought that knife back to uh, the United States, back home, and you used it for many years, and then it broke, and you wanted to go back and, and buy a new knife. And I, I, I presume when you were going back, you thought you were going to be able to pick up another Ghanaian knife. Turns out that the markets in Ghana, much like in Lagos and Johannesburg and Kampala, um, are now flooded with Chinese goods. And it was a little bit of a surprise to you that you uh, couldn't find any more Ghanaian knives. But it was interesting how you kind of came to it with a negative point of view in the sense that there was a displacement of the Ghanaian knife makers. And you thought that that was a, a negative thing. But when you talk to the shop owners, uh, they were thrilled that they had so much Chinese product to move because it was low cost, it was higher quality maybe, uh, but it was driving sales. And you open it up, your, the, the documentary, with this kind of reflection. Let's take a listen. The knife was locally made with a hand forged blade and a plain wood handle. For years, it was my favorite kitchen knife. On a recent reporting trip to Ghana, I went shopping for another knife. But this time, everywhere I went, everything was made in China. I couldn't find a Ghanaian knife or Ghanaian knife maker anywhere. Once again, it looked like another local trade had disappeared. But where I saw lost jobs and bad news for Ghana's economy, it seemed like people around me saw opportunity. Christian, tell me about how much of the film challenged that same type of presumption that you had going into making it and that you had to adjust your expectations throughout this story. Oh, the film challenged me constantly, challenged, I think, both of us. Um, but certainly my feelings about the Chinese products in Africa, in Ghana in particular, um, I had to adjust them. Um, it, both positively and negatively. I mean, the products are not all good. They're not all bad. They've definitely made life 
a lot easier for many people. The consumer goods are much more affordable than they were in the past when imports were coming from higher priced countries. Um, at the same time, a lot of these cheap goods have displaced local um, businesses, local artisans, local m manufacturing. Um, so yes, I had to rethink uh, how I felt about Chinese imports. I had to rethink how I felt about the Chinese presence. Um, I also had to rethink how I felt about globalization because I think I came to globalization before making this film, having a feeling that, you know, outsourcing is always bad because it's taking jobs from places where wages are relatively high and uh, exporting them to places where job where labor costs are low. So it's bringing down labor costs, putting people out of work. And making this film, I had to realize that, you know, globalization is very complex. And although people are hurt by globalization, opportunities also arise from globalization. You know, case in point, China, of course. But now we're also seeing um, that there might be some of this happening in Africa. And we do need to think differently, or I need to think differently about outsourcing and globalization. So for Eric and I, this was a challenge throughout the film. Um, you know, when you're making a film, you go in with ideas, you don't know what you'll find, but often your ideas are confronted with a reality that forces you to change your thinking. Yeah, and I'm just very curious because you're talking to an American audience in this film, presumably. I mean, it was, it was sponsored by the National Endowment of Humanities, if correct, uh, which was a federal grant. And so I'm, I'm curious because a lot of the people who go to film festivals and would watch this um, are people from like me, where I come from, Berkeley, California, Madison, Wisconsin, Santa Monica, California, you know, progressive liberal areas where a lot of people believe in some of the main, same things about globalization that you believe. And I think this type of story will really challenge your audience. And I'm curious to hear what kind of feedback and response that you've received uh, from people who've seen the film uh, and and what ideas particularly you know struck them Erica would you like to respond well, I, we've got we've had a really very positive response um, from people they are finding the film very very eye opening not only with the stories they had never known about but the trajectory of the film itself um, they um, they find themselves the film challenging and complex and um, I don't think Americans necessarily are used to challenging and complex stories. And I think this is one of them. Where the West once stood as a beacon of opportunity, today, China, the world's factory, beckons. Give me your buyers, your shoppers, your consuming masses. Liberty? It's for sale here, along with the Chairman Mao T-shirts. Christian, you mentioned that that the film changed your your view of globalization. Um, in the context of of migration, especially from Africa to Europe, but also to, also to the U.S., becoming a very very fraught issue, with all of African migrants, you know, drowning in the Mediterranean and the the, the Trump uh, administration travel ban. Um, how did the, the experience of the movie change and, and shape your view of migration? Well, actually, the film didn't change my view of migration at all, um, because I believe migration, immigration is important. I think immigration is what makes economies dynamic um, in, in the United States. I mean, you can see our Nobel Prize winners who are immigrants, you know, some of our biggest businesses run by immigrants. So I'm a firm believer in the positive contributions of immigration. Um, uh, I, I do think the film has, for us, what we've been happy about is people watch the film in the United States who really don't know anything about Africa and still sort of have, unfortunately, very stereotypical ideas about Africa because that's what our media um, provides for the most part. Um, to American viewers. You know, Africa is nothing but problems. African migrants are just people starving and dying in boats. Um, so I think our film is really showing people that there are many stories in Africa. There are There's a lot of dynamism in Africa. There are entrepreneurs, people who've got big ideas. Um, people are facing challenges. Um, but I think 
hear viewers watch the film and they can relate to those challenges. And I feel that they um, exit the film with a somewhat more nuanced view of Africa and African realities and, and the challenges that Africans face trying to um, move forward. So the the number of Africans in China has grown considerably over the past few years, in part because more and more students are going to Africa uh, to China, uh, particularly in Shanghai and Beijing. In fact, China takes in more African students than any other country in the world. So that's very interesting. But there's also this this trader migration that we saw in the Guangzhou Dream Factory. Right now, the numbers, the estimates are of uh, uh, between 20,000 and 100,000 in a city like Guangzhou. And I'm going to defer to scholars by the name, you know, particularly Roberto Castillo. Uh, if you don't follow him, he is by far, to, in my opinion, and I think, Kobus, you would agree, um, the most credible, the most preeminent kind of voice on uh, Africans in China, particularly in Guangzhou. And Guangzhou, again, as I mentioned at the top of the show, is the kind of capital of Guangdong province, which is the main province in southern China. And that's where there's this place called Chocolate City. Now, Chocolate City, oh, I'd say one or two years ago, was much more thriving than it is today. There's been a crackdown. There's been police moves. It's Life has gotten a lot harder for African migrants in Guangzhou. And Erica, I'm curious to, to hear from you, in part because of your background in China. You speak fluent Chinese. You've been studying there for decades and going back and forth and working there for decades, too. I'm, I'm curious to get your sense of what the attitude was on the part of Chinese in Guangzhou, because it's very difficult for us on the outside looking in, because on social media, you pick up a lot of the intolerance the racism. And it's the same thing that you pick up, by the way, about immigrants in every country. And so on the ground, obviously, it's going to be a lot more complicated. But as you were filming this and talking to Chinese people, um, I did pick up that there was this complicated view. On the one hand, Nigerians are good for business. On the other hand, there are problems that come with it. What was the mood and the feeling on the part of people towards African migrants in Guangzhou? You know, I think it was all over the map. But I think when people actually got to know some of the African traders, um, you would see friendships develop, You'd, uh, um, but you would see, you know, uh, it was hard to, for many people to bridge the cultural divides. I think that the characters in our film, for instance, Tina, had negative views. I think that some of her negative views was, um, was because of the competition the Africans presented to her in the markets. Um, she had formerly been in Africa Um that was her backstory. She had been in Africa and working there. And I think, but I think that um, many of the Chinese who got to know many of the different Africans and worked closely with them, their eyes opened up. And I think that they, you know, developed friendships. Do you know what happened to some of the characters that you um, that you followed after the filming stopped? Like you, you, you know, in the film, you mentioned some of them were preparing to leave or to go out to other countries in Asia. Um, did were you was it possible to to keep tabs on what happened with them subsequently? Yes, we've been keeping in touch with a number of characters as as much as possible. Uh, Eva, the woman from Kenya, is back in Kenya. Uh, Favor from Nigeria is back in Nigeria and 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 doing business there, but struggling because of the recent problems in Nigeria, in particular with the currency crisis, um, because she is now importing Chinese goods to Nigeria. So, um, although she, she's back in Nigeria and and things are fine, they're not, it's not easy for her. Um, Kingsley and Emmy are still in uh, China, and you know, trying to adjust to the new reality of uh, lessening, you know, restricted visa conditions, lessening volumes of trade and fewer people coming over. Um, and then there's a couple characters we've been able to hear about, um, but we haven't been able to be in touch with them because they're no longer in Guangzhou and we, we don't have contact information. You know, we can't we can no longer reach them. The film is The Guangzhou Dream Factory, filmmaker Christi uh, Christian Badgley and producer Erica Marcus are the team behind it. It is an amazing piece of documentary work. Uh, if people want to see it, where can they see it or how can they see it? It's on the film festival circuit now, but it's not publicly available. Will it be publicly available so everybody can, can, can watch it? Yes. 
we are hoping to have it, um, well, it will definitely be on television in the United States, um, also hopefully in Europe and uh, Asia and Africa, but that's going to be not, you know, for at least a year. Um, at the moment, it's available um, through educational distribution, so people who are connected to universities and other educational institutions can access the film, buy the film. Um, you might provide our <laughs> website details, but they can access the information on acquiring the film through our website. Um, so we are working and on just distribution. What, what's your website, by the way, if people want to kind of follow up with what you're doing? Yeah, it's, it's um, www.gzdreamfactory.com. So that's gzdreamfactory, all one word, dot com. Well, thank you both for joining us and for getting up so early and telling us about your amazing story. Uh, we really appreciate it. Christiane Badgley from Southern California and producer Erica Marcus uh, from my hometown in Oakland, California. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Kobus, you know, it's it's fascinating because this is a movie that I, I wish everybody on all sides of the China-Africa discussion would watch because the misperceptions that surround the, the you know, migration from the African point of view who look again to Chinese immigrants as being, you know, X, Y, and Z, and yet we see the same behavior for African migrants in Nigeria, I mean in China, uh, when we see Westerners, and we heard from Christian talking about how Americans are quite provincial thinking about Africa, I would probably extend that to China as well. I don't think Americans, for the most part, are that sophisticated there. Uh, Europeans, sim, you know, probably, you know, again, it's not in their narrative as well. And certainly in South Africa, when we talk about migration, your focus in South Africa is mostly on Southern African migration into South Africa and not, you know, Africans to China. So it seems like everybody could benefit from broadening their understanding of this complex issue. I agree. And, and it's what I really loved about the film is how it connected migration with with economics, um, you know, kind of to show the the amount of jobs these migrants create, um, the the complexity of the flows of of products and money from you know between China and Africa, and I think it really it's it's a it's a fantastic primer on you know kind of on the economic impact of migration and why migrants are so necessary for economies. It's fascinating. We'll keep everybody up to date on the availability of the film as it uh, as its release dates you know open up around the world. It's something that we'll follow and hopefully stay in touch with Christian and Erica to, to let us know. So if in your part of the world it becomes available, as soon as we see it, we will kind of blast it out across our social platforms because we hope everybody will have a chance to see it. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. We'll be back again next week. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa.